3,500 years ago, Moses led the nation of Israel out of Egypt. They wandered in the school of the wilderness for 40 years. And if you read the stories, it wasn't a pretty picture. There's lots of lessons that they, God was trying to teach them through the suffering and through the trials that they were going through. But ultimately, God had a purpose and a plan, and he wanted to lead his people into the promised land. He wanted to lead us. He'd been given that promise to Abraham more than 400 years earlier. And yet, now was the time that they were going to go enter, and they were going to enter the promised land. And Joshua was the one that was going to take him. Moses had been disqualified. But Joshua takes them into the promised land, and they begin this conquest to, to wipe out the, the evil nations that were there. The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Stalagtites, and the Stalagmites, and all those <laughs> ites. Joshua was, was sent in to wipe them out, to cleanse the land because they had gotten so wicked so that the, the, the nation of Israel could have their own place. And this is now 400 years before the kings, before King David, before King Saul, and there's this time period. It's a fascinating time period. The Bible says in Judges 17, 6 and in Judges 21, 25, it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, as you read that, it's like, hey, there's no king, so everybody did what was right. Right? That's what today people say. Everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. I think as we go through this series that we're beginning, it's going to be a multi-week series in the Judges, we're going to see that it's really like the time that we're living in, where a time where people are doing what is right in their own eyes. You know, there's, there's phrases that we hear a lot. You do you. What does that mean? That means do what you think is right, what you feel called. Be true to yourself. Is that what the Bible says? Be true to yourself. If that includes as a biological male to dress up like a woman, well, that's be true to yourself is what our culture has said. Our culture is saying that there are 107 genders now. 107. If you go to... Uh, sexualdiversity.org, obviously the authorities, they'll tell you there's 107. And if, and if you think about it, <clears throat> with our trans world, a, a guy that thinks he's a girl who's interested in a girl, does that make him, does that make him heterosexual? Or, or, no wonder there's confusion. We have this world. And now, now I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make fun of the trans or LGBTQ. I'm not making fun. I'm just saying there's confusion. And there's people that are being saying, hey, do what's right in your own eyes. Do you, do you. Be true to yourself. Now, you think that, well, that's nothing new because there's a previous generation. And some of you grew up on this song that, and you, it may be dear to your heart, but it's not a biblical song. I did it my way. <laughs> right? What's that song about? It's about doing what's right in your own eyes. We live in a time period where everybody just says, well, you just got to do what you think is right. No, you got to do what God says is right. You got to do what's right in God's eyes. What is right in God's eyes? Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. The challenge is, which advice are you going to listen to? Because there's a lot of bad advice out there. I think a large part, uh, when they, they survey um, Gen Z, those are, those are you know, teens and or early 20s, that are, that, as they're growing up now, many of them identify as one of the, those letters of the alphabet, LGBTQ plus IA, so forth. They identify with those because... Well, when they were in middle school, they didn't fit in. And if I don't fit in here, I must be one of these other things. But I don't know if anybody told them, nobody in middle school feels like they fit in. Right? If you could go back and live any life, any part of your life over, nobody says middle school. <laughs> Think about that. You don't want to go back to middle school. That is the most awkward time of our lives. And so the result is nobody feels like they fit in. And so they see one of these, they see a community. Well, maybe I'm this. Yes, you do you. And we have this cheerleading squad of the culture today that says, yes, you can do it. You can be whoever you want to be. Don't let biology define you. 
Don't let reality define you. Every cell in your body may say boy or girl, XY or XX chromosome, but don't let that tell you what you can do. You do what's right in your own eyes. Proverbs 21, 2, every man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Fascinating image that we, that we have, the, the, the scales of justice weighing, what, which, which way is the right way? Even in the, in the Bible, um, you remember the story in Daniel chapter 5, um, Belshazzar is, this, is the king of Babylon, and he's living it up. He's being attacked. His nation is being attacked. The city of Babylon is being attacked, and he throws, what does he do? Instead of preparing, he throws a party. He throws a party, and he takes the, the implements, the vessels from the temple of Israel that they had, they had uh, conquered, and it was like basically in the Babylon Museum, and he goes, and he gets the cups and the goblets and all those things, and he throws a party, and he gets everybody drunk while they're being attacked. And at that moment... There's a hand writing on the wall. And what does the hand say? Many, many, tekel you farce. And basically, you've been weighed and found wanting. Your kingdom's divided and it's being handed over. Basically, they don't know what it means because it's written in Hebrew and it's written backwards and all these different things. But ultimately, weighed and found wanting. He did what was right in his own eyes. He was throwing a party. He thought he was invincible. Many people today feel that way. I'm invincible. I can do whatever I want. Well, we back up our story just a little bit. Moses is charging the nation of Israel before they go into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 7, here's their whole retelling of the law. He's given them all the instructions. In Deuteronomy 7, he's telling them, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, and the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples whom you are afraid. In other words, they were about to enter the promised land, but they'd, they'd been wandering for 40 years, and they're told that they're supposed to just wipe everybody out. They're supposed to bring the judgment of God because the people were wicked. All the people were wicked, and you're supposed to go in and, and wipe them out. But remember... This is a place that 40 years earlier, they saw that, well, they were grasshoppers in the sight of these huge people. There were giants in the land. They thought, well, this is a land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a beautiful land, and yet, it's a scary land. And they were nervous. And Moses is telling him, you saw what God did in Egypt. He's gonna do the same thing. Trust him. Verse 20, moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them all at once, lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. You hear Moses speaking the word of God, basically saying, God is going to do it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Just step out in faith. I'm going to do this. Verse 24, and he will give their kings into your hand, and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is in them, or take it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. And you shall not bring an abominable thing into your house and become devoted to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest and abhor it, for it is devoted to destruction. He's given, he's laying out, don't fall prey. In this land, in this land of Canaan, which was going to become Israel, there was lots of wickedness, there was lots of idolatry, there were lots of problems. In fact, as we, if we were to study detailed, the culture of that day is so much similar to our today, ours today. In terms of um, homosexuality in terms of the, 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 the hedonism, the materialism, all that is going on in our world today is just like that time, just like that time period. And Moses is saying, just believe the promises of God. God is the one who is going to do this for you. You need to walk it out. Remember Joshua, even Joshua was nervous because in Joshua 1, repeatedly about four times, be strong and courageous. 
Even the people had to say back to Joshua, be strong and courageous, Joshua, you could do this. Okay, and Joshua did. Joshua did, he led the people in. And for seven years, they began to conquer the Canaanite land. But they didn't conquer all the enemies. Joshua 1, 1, I mean, Judges 1, 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. Fascinating. Okay, so Joshua had conquered a bunch, but Joshua dies. And so there's still more to be conquered, just like God said. There will be more to be conquered. It's going to take some time to wipe out the enemy of the land. But do it in faith. They pray, okay, okay, God, who do you want us to do next? What do you, who's going to lead the charge next? God tells them Judah. So Judah goes, and Judah defeats the enemy over and over and over again. And it's a fascinating story there in Judges 1 and how Judah, the southern tribe, uh, who actually had at one point the largest section of the land of Israel, um, begins to drive them out. And he drives them out. Yet what's fascinating at the end of the chapter, Judges 127, each of the, the tribes of Israel was to drive out the people in their land, in their allotted territory. But notice what happens, verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh, or its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. What happens is that tribe of Manasseh, they tried to drive them out, but it just wasn't happening. But God said it was going to happen. But it just wasn't happening. And the Canaanites persisted. Notice what happens. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Verse 30. Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Verse 33. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants... And he lists a whole bunch of people. Verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. So we see this. God had given them promises. God said, I'm going to go before you. And yet when they walked in, they got something happened. And they weren't able to conquer the lands that God had given them. And what's worse is that the very last statement there, Dan was supposed to go into the land, into this, peop into this area that they'd been given. But it says... The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country. Look here on the map, and you'll see where each of these, uh, the tribes were allotted land, okay? And you can see, you got Judah down there uh, in the bottom, and then right above Judah, there's this little strip called Dan. That area is one of the best places in Israel. It's on the coast. It's beautiful land. It's, it's great for farming and, and, um, and ranching, you know, cattle, uh, cattle, sheep, and so forth. It's, a, it's an amazing little swath of land. They've got one of the smallest sections because they were a smaller tribe, but they were given some of the best land. But here's what happened. They went in to try to take possession of that land, and the Amorites fought back, and they, 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 Dan said, well, well, we're not winning, and I don't know what we're going to do. And so instead what they did is they went clear to the north, next screen, and they found an area up at the very top that wasn't allotted to anybody, and they found some little, tri little villages there, and they conquered them. And they said, you know what, we're going to go up here. This is easy. You know what, this is better. This is easier. They took the easy way. They didn't take the land that God wanted them to have. They took the easy way. Now, the problem was that that land clear in the north well, the nation of Israel, when you stay together, you stay strong. But when you're on the edges, it's easy to pick it off, pick off a person. You know, when a, when a lion hunts um, a, a gazelle or hunts, um, there's a, there, there may be a, a whole herd of animals that it's hunt, it tries to pick one off. And if it can pick one off, then it can, it can win. And that's what happened with the nation of, with the tribe of Dan, they said, we're, 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 you know what? It's too hard to do what God's called us to do. So you know what? This land up north is really nice. And honestly, that area up in Dan, when we, visit, when we go to Israel, we visit that area. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's lush and it's, it's forested and it's, it's amazing. It is. It's beautiful. But it was a compromise from what God had. It, was a, it wasn't God's best for them. 
And Dan, as a result, was one of the first tribes to go into idolatry, one of the first tribes then to also go into captivity and to be silenced. What the thought was by Dan that the promises of God had been broken. God had promised that he was going to go with us, but somehow when we tried to do it, it just didn't work. And so, ah, over and over again, God makes a promise, and then God tests the promise. God gave Abraham a promise. What was the promise to Abraham? I'm going to make you a great nation. All right, but here's a couple that's been struggling with infertility for 25 years. And now they're getting up there. And Sarah's like, it ain't going to happen with this body, so why don't you get, take Hagar? So instead of trusting the promises of God, they did what was right in their own eyes. And when they did what was right in their own eyes, Abraham had relations with Hagar. Hagar had a son called Ishmael. Ishmael becomes the, the nation that is connected today to the Palestinians. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict goes back to Abraham doing what was right in his own eyes. Not believing the promises of God. Jacob's given the promise that he's going to inherit the land, that he's going to be given, he's going to inherit the promises that were given to, to, to Abraham. And he wanders, and he wanders, and then he wonders, is it really going to happen? God tests the promise. God gives you a promise, then he tests the promise. What promises has God given you that he's tested and it hasn't come through yet? And you're like, I'm, I don't know. Like, I, I, read this, I read the scriptures that, well, whom the sun sets free will be free indeed. So God, why am I still struggling with smoking? God says that you can be free. Yeah, but it's just, it's just not happening. It's just not working. Well, I still struggle with pornography, so it's just, you know, it's just one of those things. It's one of those things guys do. No, no, don't settle. Amen. God wants you to be free, but don't believe the lies that, well, it yet happens for other people, but I don't know, there's just something about me in this, and, and, and you feel it fill in the, the, the blank with your addiction or your stronghold or that thing that's holding you captive, and God says, no, you can be set free if you believe the promises. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. See, that's the thing. Everybody thinks that, well, it's just going to be, you know, the promises of God, then it just happens easy. No, it's simple, but it's not easy. There's a battle. There's a battle, and you have to fight for it. We think that, well, it's just because God made the promise, so just, just stand on the promise. And then if you get blown over, well, oh, well, you at least tried. No! You get blown over, then you stand up, and you get blown over again, you stand up, and you say, God, I'm trusting your word. I haven't seen it, but I still choose to believe it. And that's when the breakthrough comes through. Right. Pastor Dave was talking about that last Sunday. Yeah. That, that the, whether it's depression, should the child of God be depressed? Shouldn't be depressed, and yet when we read David, he was depressed, and yet he was, had high highs and he had low lows. But it's, it's, it's calling it down and saying, God, God, I, this is where I am, but I choose to believe you over my experience. See, Satan lies to us, and he twists our experience. He, he, he takes the experience that we have, and he twists it to make God look bad, to make it look like God is going to break his promise, to make it look like God is not going to come through on his promise. And then as a result, I'm looking at the situation, and I've just got to do what's best for me. What's right in my own eyes. I mean, I, I can't do this because that's not happening. So, and I guess, I know God loves me, but maybe he doesn't love me as much as he did with the other guys that have been set free in my accountability group. Maybe he doesn't love me, or maybe he loves me, but maybe he's just like, I'm just going through a trial. I'm just going through a test. And so I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to wait until God shows up. That's what the nation of Israel did. They waited till God showed up and God said, no, 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 no. You got to take a step. You got to take a stand. That's what our series is about doing what's right in God's eyes. We look here, Judges 2 11, 
And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They began to do what was right in their, in their own eyes. And the result is it's evil in the Lord's eyes. But basically, they compromised. Instead of wiping out the nations that were there, they compromised. They allowed them to stay. And then when they saw them, they're like, well, they're worshiping their gods. And what, what's the deal with their gods? The Baals. What's it, what, what is this Baal thing? And then they look around. They're like, all these other nations, they worship Baal. Baal was a common deity that everybody worshiped. It's like, well, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is worshiping Baal. Maybe if I worshiped Baal and sacrificed to Baal, God would bless my crops. Maybe if I did that, God would bless me with a child. And, and little seeds are planted and that Satan comes in and leads us astray. They began to do what was evil in the Lord's eyes. Verse 12, and they abandoned the, the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was the, the uh, wife of Baal in, in, in some mythologies there and, and goddess of fertility um, and so they're going after these other gods. Baal was the storm god. He was the bringer of rain. So he was recognized as sustaining the fertility of crops and animals and people. And his followers believed that sexual acts performed in his temple would boost Baal's sexual prowess and thus contribute to his work in increasing fertility. They begin to believe the lies. Have we embraced the gods of this world? We, we can look back at those people and say, yeah, but they, they, were, they were unenlightened. I don't sacrifice to gods. I, don't, I haven't embraced gods of this world. Really? One of the gods is materialism. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, 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 I got some stuff, but that's okay. It's okay to have stuff as long as the stuff doesn't have you. True. But where does that tipping point come where you got so much stuff to worry about? Where is that point? If you're doing what's right in your own eyes, you'll never know. Are you trying to keep up with others? Are you have a, is there a status thing that you got to do? You know, you got to have the right shoes. Several of you noticed my shoes, I know. <laughs> so uh, this, this, is, this is a crazy thing. Kid, uh, young people today, I got to be careful here. Um, like shoes are like a, a status symbol. Like they spend literally thousands of dollars on tennis shoes. And, and I did not spend thousands of dollars on these tennis shoes. Somebody gave them to me. And honestly, that's, but they're nice and they match and it's like, okay. And the whole thing is, it was, it's funny. Even as I got dressed today, I was like, okay, what am I going to wear? And I'm like, I'm teaching on the book of judges. I should probably wear something that's black and white. And, and, and then I saw the clothes and. And I realized, you know what, I'm going to wear this. Well, because, well, I think it looks nice. But then, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but then, but then what, how much of that is it? Because I'm, well, I'm trying to look nice. You know, I'm on stage and everyone sees me. Or how much of it is like, you know, how much are we finding identity in our acceptance of other people, in our attaboys? We live in a culture that it's all about the number of likes, the number of followers, the number of views, the number of subscribers. What are those things? Those are idols. Those are gods that we bow down to. I gotta, uh, how many likes? Oh, only six people like that. I wonder what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> or that selfie. You know, the most common picture online is this. Why? Because I want, I want that affirmation. I'm looking for that, like, am I okay? Am I okay? I look okay, right? I, and so we have this thing where we're, 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 we're bowing down to these gods to find identity in the acceptance of others. We're bowing down to these gods of, well, there's, there's lots of other gods too. There's gods of entertainment and pleasure. You know, do you have a good package of watching, of, of that could be taken a couple different ways. Um, <laughs> you have, do you have a, good video package that you're, or, you know, like, well, we need this one. We need this one because I like these and I like that. Well, I don't like this. Well, this, you know, hey, 
I need max because I, I just I want all of it. And really, really, there's a, there a time that it was called Cinemax, and we we called it Sin to the Max. Because that's, all, that's what a lot of that stuff is. But we're in a culture that is so used to medicating ourselves through amusement. And I mean, I, I, I do it. At the end of the day, I'm like, okay, you know, YouTube, and you watch the reels, and then all of a sudden, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 10 minutes, 20. It's like, what, what am I doing? You get sucked into that, and hours can go by. What have I done? I've just medicated myself. To what God really wants me to do is to look and examine my heart. Am I doing what's right in my eyes or what's right in God's eyes? Am I investing in something that has eternal value? It's okay. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to watch a movie. But what is it? What's the content? What is it that I'm putting before me, before my eyes? We have hobbies. It's funny. Yeah, we don't have idols, but we do have hobbies. And, and it's, I, I love, hey, I love going to a Dolphins game. I think it's fun. But you can see idolatry at, down at the stadium. I mean, because I, you they're, they're just completely decked out in all the, in the garb. And I've got my, got my number of my guy here. And why? Because I'm identifying with this guy. And what makes me so drawn to him is because well, he's famous, because he's good, because he's... And as a result, it's so easy to get sucked into this thing that's really just one big worship fest of football, of success. Sports aren't necessarily bad, but where is it taking its place in your heart and where's that line that it crosses? Or the other hobbies, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's, maybe it's working out. Oh. oh man, you wanna talk about an idol? I, I have a friend, I have a friend that's a, that, that was a bodybuilder and, and he was, he was, he was stacked, and, you know. Um, and he said it, was, it, was, it became an idol in his life. He had to put it down. Now, he didn't grow a belly, but he had to, he had to stop. You know, just the thing is that you, you, start, you keep looking to see, how am I doing? Am I, did I lose? Am I, am I slim? And you're, it becomes this thing that sucks you in. And God says, no, no. There's nothing wrong with working out. In fact, most of us should work out. We should. Some of us could work out some more. And, but we need to be healthy, but we got to be careful, be careful of the temple that the temple doesn't become the idol as well. So we have lots of gods, and which gods are we bowing down to? The ancient world, they had sacrifices, and they sacrificed sheep and goats, bulls, and even kids for prosperity. But we do the same thing. We sacrifice our time, our money, our relationships for those things. We sacrifice. What are you sacrificing? Look at your time. Look at your calendar. Where's your investment? We all, we're all investing in something, but what things are we investing in? And are those things that are right in God's eyes, or are they right in our eyes? Judges 2, 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. God wanted to bless them. God wanted them to step out in victory. And so they're like, okay, okay, we gotta step out in victory. We gotta do this. But there was so much compromise. God said, I'm not gonna bless that. They've been worshiping these other idols. They've been worshiping these other gods. And God says, I'm not gonna bless that. In fact, not only am I not gonna bless it, I'm gonna bring persecution. I'm gonna bring hardship. God brings hardship? God brings pain? God hands them over to the plunderers? Does that sound like the God that you grew up with? That's definitely not the God of today's world. The God of today is a nice God. He does what's nice for me. And all of his promises are yes and amen, and they're all good. God wants to bless you. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I read, I mean, it's, it's crazy the things I read on social media that sound so good, 
And yet they're not about a holy God. They're about a God that we've made in our own image, a God that's right in our eyes. If God was, you know, if God's really God, he's gonna be like this. No, he's gonna be holy. God allows pain to wake us up. That's what, that's what pain's for. God created you with senses in your body, nerve cells, so that when you feel pain, that you know something's wrong. That's the purpose of pain, is to wake you up. And yet, we've gotten really good at numbing the pain. We numb the pain through our addictions, through our amusement, through all these things, and as a result, we're in a zombified state, and Satan says yes, and God says no. And sometimes we're at this place where we have to choose. Are we going to step forward or are we just going to step back? Hebrews 12, 5. And have, you, have you, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Discipline. We give in discipline because God loves us. He loves us and he doesn't want us to stay as we are. And he gives us boundaries because he wants to protect us. Several years ago, um, I had, had my kids and we're, we're at a a parking lot of an old uh, big box store, okay? And the, the store had gone out, so the parking lot was empty. And it was a great place to take the kids um, so they can practice riding their bicycles. And, you know, they're learning to ride their bike, and they, they're doing okay, but I just wanted to give them more practice. And so we're there. We're just kind of hanging out. And um, I told one of my sons, I said, okay, I, um, this, other, well, sorry, this other car comes in, and it's a, it's a blazer. And... Um, and they're just driving around the parking lot. And I look closely, and it's this, this girl that's driving, like teenage girl, with her dad. What were they doing? Learning. She was learning to drive. And so I'm looking at the situation, and I'm like, hmm. So I told my sons, hey, guys, just, just ride your bikes here. I want you riding up and down this section um, right in front of the, the, the store. I don't want you going out here in this other area, okay? Just, just ride this section. And so they're riding for a little bit, and then my son starts to wander, and he's going to the area that I told him not to go to. And, and, and this, the girl, she's driving over here, and she's doing her thing, and I'm like, mm, no, I told him this. He needs to learn to trust me that when I say do this, do this. So I stop him, and I say, no, nope, you're in timeout. Go sit up. Go sit up. I, you went off outside the lines. I told you. But Dad, there's no big deal. We've got this whole parking lot. Why can't I go ride my bike in the whole parking lot? Son, what did I say? Okay. So he sits there. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, the girl's come in and she goes over to this area and she, she grazes against the curb and she freaks out and tries to hit the brake, but instead of hitting the brake, hits the gas. She pops up over the curb and hits a tree, completely, down, um, completely damaging the front end of her Bronco. And I'm there like... Now, I, I didn't realize right then, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the dad, and I'm thinking about the car, and I'm thinking about the girl, and then I'm thinking about the Lord showed me, that could have been your son yeah. riding, because she didn't have control. She looked like she was doing okay, and God was saying, I give you rules to protect you. You think that they're a bummer. They're supposed to be a blessing. They're there. You've got to trust me that when I say, don't be unequally yoked, don't date a non-Christian, don't do missionary dating that you, you think that you know better and that's right in your own eyes. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bless you. Don't go into business with a non-Christian. What's wrong with that? What's, don't, but they, they kind of love God. I mean, they, they, they say they're a Christian, but they're not born again and on fire. They're going to drag you down. It, well, it's, it's okay if we just live together because everybody does it. You know, try before you buy. Right in your own eyes. 90% of relationships that try before they buy, in other words, that they live together, 90% of people that live together either never get married or if they do, they divorce. 90%. Do you want to practice divorce? Live together. That's what the statistics are. 
But God's word, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a whole big playground out there and you can do anything. Yeah, you can do anything, but not everything is beneficial. And God says, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Trust me at this. Yeah, but, uh, but I, don't, I don't know what the big deal is. Where in your life right now are you allowing that compromise? Are you allowing that little voice to say, I can ride my bike wherever I want? And you don't know that you're about to be taken out. Mm-hmm. Hebrews 12, 9. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. God has a purpose. Nobody likes discipline, but part of being a disciple is to have discipline. If you want to be a disciple, you're going to have discipline. And it's, oh, it's so hard. I love food, okay? And it may not look like it, but I I exercise, and sometimes I eat more than I should, and then I have to exercise extra to try to take off the food. And and, and, and then the Lord's like, you still have gluttony. But Lord, it, but it tastes so good. <laughs> we we had um, went to a birthday party yesterday and um, had this amazing moist cake. And it was like so good. And I had a nice piece. It was just the right size. And <laughs> so the thing is, if it was at my house, <clears throat> I would have had another piece. But I was I was at somebody else's house, right? So as I walked by, I just kind of sneak a little extra piece of the, you know, the piece of the cake that had fallen, just little pieces, because they're crumbs. Nobody's going to want the little piece. So I'm just, and I had like one or two of these as I go by, and then I'm like, I really want another piece. But I'm like, no. And honestly, the only thing that kept me from going to another piece is because there's other people watching. Thank God for accountability. Right? We need that. We need accountability. We need the community. <laughs> Discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, and yet it has a purpose. That discipline is to yield that peaceful fruit of righteousness. Is God taking you through some discipline and you're resisting? I don't want to do that. We have this flesh. I find that. I, I, I need to fast on a regular basis because if I don't fast on a regular basis, my flesh gets stronger. But when I fast, my, I'm, I'm telling my flesh that, hey, you know what? Holy Spirit's in charge here. But when I don't fast, it's very easy for me to give in to that temptation, very easy for me to give in and walk in a little bit of indulgence because it's, it's not that big a deal. It's not, it's, it's not a sin to eat cake or two pieces or three. <laughs> Judges, back in Judges, chapter 2, verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. God is compassionate. God wants to set you free, but he's looking for you to turn from your idols for satisfaction. You know, that's why we sacrifice. That's why we bow down to an idol because we think that we're gonna get something that's gonna satisfy. So we try to look like everybody else. We try to dress like everybody else. We try to get those things that will make us feel like, if I just have this, I'll be satisfied. Or we, recognize, or we recognize the dissatisfaction, and so then we go shopping. Retail therapy, you know, that helps. And the result is we're just medicating. We're just turning to one idol to the next. And God says, when, when are you going to, to, to lay the idols down and really be set free? He wants to set you free, but he's looking for you to take that step. Verse 19, but whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. 
in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. In other words, he had told them, I'm gonna give you the whole land, I'm gonna fight your battles for you, you just gotta take the step. And when they didn't take the step, or when they took the step and God didn't show up like they expected, and then they stepped back, God says, do it, you can do it. But then they didn't, and after a while, when they finally said, I don't think I can do it, and God's like, right, you can't. I'm not with you, because you're trusting in other gods. You've made compromises, and as a result, you're missing the blessing of God. You're missing the promise. And then that led them back further and further until at some point they realized, God, what am I going to do? That place of helplessness. That place where we totally surrender. And so Israel as a nation would come to that place and they would go, we've messed up. We are oppressed. We're being, we're being treated like slaves by these other nations. And at that point, when they cry out to God and they've turned away from their idols and say, God, all I want is you. I believe, I fu- God, I just believe in your word. Help me, save me. That's when God shows up. Amen. Most people today aren't there. And as a result, they're still doing what's right in their own eyes, hoping that it'll work, hoping they'll find something that'll bring deliverance. And God says, you're trusting the wrong things. I love this verse in um, Matthew 5, the New Living, um, a little bit more of a paraphrase, but it says from the Sermon on the Mount, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's when we say, God, I need you. I can't do anything without you that God says, now we're talking. In our world today that we have a self-made man and we've got the the, the, the plump 401k, and things are going well, don't need God. And God says, okay, let's see how this goes. <laughs> Judges 3, verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, he gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. 18 years they're being oppressed. 18 years they've got to sacrifice, they've got to give tribute to this other king, Moab. He's across the Jordan. He's not even in the promised land. Verse 15, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. So here, God raises up this guy because the people finally are crying out. After 18 years of, at first, it was probably like, well, it's just like, it's not a big deal. You just kind of give the money that you need to and they give it to Moab. And, and but eventually, the oppression becomes so heavy that the people are crying out. It's like, God, we need something else. This isn't working. My family's suffering. God, when are you going to show up? God, we need you. And as a result, God has pity on them and says, okay, I'm going to send you Ehud. Now, who's this? This is one of the judges who was a left-handed man. At that time, very few people were left-handed, okay? And God is going to specifically use him for a purpose. The, the judge, um, God chooses, God chooses judges based on his own character. He knows what is best, but <clears throat> but sometimes we look at the person and it's like, I don't know, he's a left-handed guy. Can't trust those left-handed guys. <laughs> How many of you left-handed people are here? <laughs> hey. Okay. So here's the deal. Sometimes we look at a person and it's like, you know what, I don't think, or we look at ourselves and we're like, I don't know, I don't think that's really, I'm, that God's going to use me. When we get to Gideon, we'll, we'll talk more about that as well. Lots of stories. There's so much of, of Judges that really applies to us because it's, it's us. It's us here. And so here's Ehud, left-handed man. He didn't fit in. God, why did you make me this way? All my family is this way, but now I'm this way. I don't fit in. And yet God had a purpose. I don't know if you know the story of Amy Carmichael. She grew up in a Christian home in Ireland, and she had brown eyes. But she always wanted to have blue eyes. 
His blue eyes are so pretty, and I just want the blue eyes. God, why didn't you make me with blue eyes? But then she felt called to minister in India. She went to India and um, missionary, and while she was over there, she saw the slave trade selling young girls to Hindu temples to become sex slaves. She dyed her hair or her skin brown with coffee, and the brown eyes allowed her to work undercover to rescue girls. She thought, I wasn't perfect because I didn't have blue eyes. Blue eyes would have made me perfect. Lord, why didn't you give me blue eyes? Because I had a purpose. I created you. I didn't make a mistake when I made you. I didn't make a mistake. So many people are today are thinking that God made a mistake, putting the wrong person in the wrong body. No, no mistakes. No mistakes. Judges 3, 17. And Ehud pre presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Eglon was very fat. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a verse. Um, verse 16. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. Remember, he's specifically, he's specially equipped. He's left-handed. And so when you'd go in to see the king, they'd always check you to make sure, you know, they had the metal detector, right? But the metal detector only checked this side because a right-handed person would draw their sword like this. Now, the sword that he has, it says it was a cubit in length. Now, this is what's crazy. Okay, this is a Roman machaira, gladius. This one's just a little bit long. Um, this is, technically, it's a cubit, but the cubit could have been anywhere from, this is 22 inches down to 18 inches, okay? So this is like the sword. This was a thousand, almost a thousand years before the Romans conquered the world with this sword. Up until that time, people just had long swords and they'd use two hands. But what, what Ehud did is he put this under his tunic and he put it on his right side because then he could do this. Now watch what happens to Ehud. Verse 17, and he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded, silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in the cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. So basically, the king, he's got all of his entourage there. Ehud says, I've got a special message. Now, the king doesn't know what's hiding here under his tunic. Verse 21, Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went into the, and after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. So basically, Ehud stabs him in the gut, it goes all the way in, including the handle. I mean, this, this Ehud, or uh, Eglon was a big boy, okay? So it's literally, it goes all the way through. You can't see the sword. And then the dung or the refuse comes out. And um, Ehud did this in, in a plan because he was all alone. So he had already, he had a plan not only to kill him, but he also had a plan of escape. Verse 23, then Ehud went out from the, into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. And when he had gone, the servant came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. In other words, he went to the bathroom. <laughs> he did, yeah, the dung came out the other way. But anyway, and they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. This guy that was their oppressor, that was really a demigod in a sense, they had to go in and they had to assassinate. There's a saying from a Puritan writer, be killing sin or it will be killing you. We need to treat sin with seriousness and like cut it off completely. Jesus said, if your right arm offends you, what do you do? Cut it off. And yet so often we're like, well, I'm just going to trim my nails. <laughs> I mean, I, I cut something off, God, and so it doesn't help? It's like, no, trimming your nails. Well, you think, you think it's right in your own eyes. Well, I trimmed something. No, 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 
you got to cut the whole thing off. Yeah, but that's pretty radical, God. Jesus, you, know, you, you didn't really mean that, right? Not literally cut your hand off, but if there's something spiritually that's sucking you in, why are you tolerating it? Why are you allowing it to have place, to have a foothold in your life to keep you in bondage? Verse 26, he who escaped while they delayed and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarai. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So uh, Ehud, he, said, he sounds the alarm, he says, guys, let's go. God has given them into your hand, not God has given them into my hand. It's fascinating. As a leader, he says, follow me, but God has given them into your hand. You've got to take possession. And what they did is they, they were all running to this, the fords here at the Jordan. There was a narrow place where everybody was crossing the Jordan. Remember, remember that Moab is outside the promised land, and so they're going to come and try to attack. And they basically set a, a, an ambush there, and they killed every Moabite. They basically said, no, you cannot come into my house. You cannot come into my territory. Have you done that with your house? Have you done that with your life and said, no, I'm not allowing the enemy to come in through what comes on your TV, through what comes onto your phone, through what's talked about in your house. When you're talking about stuff, are you gossiping and you're entertaining demons basically? Well, it's, just, it's a prayer request. We're praying for so-and-so. Did you hear about so-and-so? Is, is, is that godly? You're allowing the enemy to come in. You're allowing him to sneak in. Where are you allowing the enemy to come into your house? Oh, I'm good. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm in victory. You're also in denial. Because every one of us have areas where we don't even realize it, where we're allowing the enemy in, and pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, because we think that we're good. We think that our world is secure. Last night, um, I was at home, and I was on my computer working just a little bit, and I saw something move over here. I said, what is that? And I, and I, and I see it. Cockroach. <laughs> Want to come for dinner? <laughs> so I see the cockroach. I see the cockroach on the floor, and I'm like, ugh. And I grab my boot, and I'm like, and I, I, I don't know about you. I'm like, I'm always squeamish on those, those things. I'm like, you know, but I'm, when I see the cockroach, so I'm not going to let that cockroach go, because I know that lead one leads where well, there's many, right? So I'm, I'm not, so I'm getting the boot, and I'm like, mm, and I, I hit it with a, 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 a violence, mm, trying to get this cockroach. I get the cockroach. Why? Because I don't want them in my house. Do you have that same kind of hatred of sin? And compromise? Do you have that same kind of... Because that's what God's desiring. He says, you have to fall on your knees and say, God, I don't want anything else. I don't want any compromise. I don't want to bow before any idols. I only want you. The book of Judges is, yeah, it's about a lot of compromise. It's about doing what's right in their own eyes instead of what's right in God's eyes. And a lot of people, some people will leave here thinking, okay, I, you know what? You're right, You're right, Pastor. I just got to try harder. No, 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 no. It's not about trying harder. So many people, they try harder, and the message becomes legalism. No. It's about what they did. What the nation of Israel did is they fell on their faces, and they cried out to God and said, God, deliver me. God, help me. That's when deliverance comes. It's not believing that you can do it in your own strength, because that just gives more pride. It's Fall on your face and say, God, I need you. My experience is here, but the word of God says this. I'm choosing to believe the word of God and that you are my deliverer, that you're my healer, that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So by faith, Lord, I believe that I'm being set free. So help me to walk in that freedom. God has delivered the enemy into your hand, he says. So Lord, fight the battles. Every time in the scriptures here, in the book of Judges, God raises up a judge. God is raising up the hero. You're not, you don't have to be the hero. Do you know that? You don't have to be the hero. 
Jesus is our hero. He's already fought the battle. We just stand behind him. We need to get in line and say, yes, God, we're behind you, as opposed to, yeah, you got it, God. I'm going to go do something else, because I'm more interested in TikTok, YouTube, this, Netflix. No, 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 no. God, I want to get behind you. I don't want to be led astray by any of these things. I'm going to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Most people complain about what's wrong with their life, but few are willing to do the work necessary to bring about change. Most complain, but few change. Will you be a complainer or a changer? Do you really want change? Because people say they want change, and they'll do a lot of complaining, but are you at a place where you're willing to just fall on your face and say, God, I need you to set me free of the pornography, of the alcohol, of the gossip, of the gluttony, of the, and you fill in the gap. It's not about trying harder. It's receiving the grace and thanking God that he has done it. Application, where are you doing what is right in your own eyes? Allow the Lord to search your heart. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. We're gonna close here in just a moment. But allow the Lord to search your heart. Where are you allowing compromise? Where are you doing what... Well, it seems like it's the right thing to do, and yet there's a check in your spirit because it's not the right thing to do. But, 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 but it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it makes sense because it probably makes more sins, and you need to surrender it to him. And last thing, what promises of God do you need to take hold of? And not that you need to like do, taking the promise of God and saying, God, you've done, and resting in his word. Take some time now. Let the Lord search your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the judges. May your Holy Spirit, Lord, search our hearts right now that we would not do what's right in our own eyes. For our eyes are deceptive. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, Lord, may your word search May your word be that searchlight that searches our hearts. And may you show, those, show us those things that we've made compromises with the enemy, where we've bowed down to idols for acceptance. God, we just want you. May we be satisfied with nothing less than all of you. Allow the Lord just to search your heart right now. Spend some time with him.